Yes, sir. Welcome back to Talking Nets. Whether you're listening in Minnesota in class or whether you're on your way to class, whether you're on your way to work, welcome back to Talking Nets, episode 84. Keith McPherson and Hudson Flynn. We got a lot to talk about. I'm already uh, turning up the pace because there's so much to talk about. Hudson Flynn, how are you doing? It is Monday, March 1st. We balling like the March Madness. We in here. How you doing, bro? Man, I'm doing good. Good to hear we have some some Minnesota Nets fans. Always talking about there's no <laughs> Nets fans. We got Nets fans out in Minnesota up in the Great White North. So that's pretty exciting. Pretty exciting for the podcast. And definitely exciting for, for Nets world because it, it's pretty clear that it's, it's coming about time where you're either on the bandwagon or you're not on the bandwagon. And it's looking like a pretty big bandwagon. I mean, the bandwagon has been full but it just like keeps getting new people from, uh, I don't know, the time KD signed to then we traded for Harden. Then we go on an eight game winning streak. Now the fans are back in the arenas and people are choosing sides. Which uh, stadium arena do they want to go to? All that is good and well. Um, but what I am most proud of right now is that the Nets are who we thought they were. And it doesn't matter if we lost a game recently. It doesn't matter. Uh if, you know, guys are resting, KD shut down, this, that, and the other. The Nets are looking like the favorites. The Nets are looking like the team to beat the best team in the league after what they did out West. And we're here to talk about it today. We've gotten so much love lately. I can't start this podcast without talking about the love. When I say, where's the love? They give the love back. And, uh, you know, I'm proud because talking Nets, we've come a, a long way in the last year. And I think Hudson and I are really like coming into our own with this podcast and our dynamic and, you know, being guys that talk about the Nets and, uh, you know, being involved in Nets Twitter and now trying to get into the stadium. Hudson, are you trying to go to the game? Are you trying to go to any of these games? You think, you think I have $250 laying around to watch the Pistons <laughs> fr from the goddamn top row? Nah. It, like, I'm not paying that much money to fall down the stairs and get a concussion. Like, nah. it's just it's just not worth it. I can't do it, bro. I can't do it, bro. So we'll talk about the tickets first. And the thing about the tickets is it sucks how the Nets played this. Nets, like Brooklyn, BSE Global, anybody listening from the ticket office, I love y'all, but y'all played it all wrong, right? And I hate talking about that other team, but they played it right. They had tickets under $100, and from the jump, they started letting regular-looking fans in. Now, on the other side... You look at the Nets, they got living rooms and uh, the living room tables and fake plants. It looked like a uh, crate and barrel or a Ikea or something in the Barclays Center, which like I get. I understand what y'all are trying to do. But then the first game we have fans back, there's executives, people rolling in in suits and corporate looking like bougie fans. And I'm like, oh, my. Like, I get it, yo. I, I, I get it. I get the profit loss. I get the contracts. I get that we're the number one team in the NBA and you got to make the money back, but the optics were all off. How'd you feel, bro? As a fan, we're both fans. We clip up the game. We make gifts of the game. We watch the game. We talk to other fans and we've been waiting to get back into the arena as well. And the first people you see in the arena, you're like, are those fans? And nobody on Nets Twitter. The first game I was talking to everybody. We got group chats on Twitter, Instagram, and I'm checking with people nobody I knew was at that first game. Yeah, no, it was tough. And like a little behind the scenes, me and Keith were talking. Keith was like, Hudson, make sure you get, you know, the first shot they have of fans walking into the Barclays Center on the pregame. And they didn't even show it for most of the pregame. And then at the very end of the pregame, you see a couple guys walking in in suits looking like they've never watched a game of basketball in their lives. And when we put that tweet out and showed, you know, everyone what it looked like, people were disappointed. But it makes sense. Like, if those are the seats that you're putting out for those prices, you're not going to get, you know, I don't want to say real basketball fans, but you know, the everyday, you know, you know, Joe on the street basketball fan that can't afford, you know, these mega price tickets to sit in these living room style seats where you can't even see the court. And it's more about appearances and networking and trying to make that corporate statement than it is watching a basketball game. And I know we're blessed as Nets fans to have a great yes network crew to have you know great time on twitter a good fan community 
but the experience of going to a game is different. I was looking through like the Apple tickets on my phone and I was looking, scrolling through all the Nets games I went to last season. And I was like, man, boy, I, 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 I just can't, you can't replace that feeling and to, to know that it's an, it's an option and it's available, but I just can't do it. I just can't afford it. I just can't make it happen is a little heartbreaking, honestly. It is heartbreaking. Uh, I, I go to games. That's like my main thing. Before 2020, this weird ass year happened and shut everything down. My main thing was like, yo, I'm creating content around going to Nets games, really Yankees games. But I started to wonder when I was doing it with the Nets, I'm like, can I, or with the Yankees, I'm like, can I do this with the Nets? And I did start to do that a little bit. But now those days of getting into the Barclays Center right before the game, going through the apps and and snagging a ticket for 25 bucks, that's over. Goodbye. And now I'm looking at tickets, right? So the first game I looked at, because they announced today, okay, single game tickets are on sale. The first game I look at is uh, April 5th, Knicks versus Nets. And I'm like, let me just take a look at what this is like. Because I actually have been to, you know, two or three of those matchups. I've been to them in Barclays Center. I've been in, uh, been in them in Madison Square Garden. It's on my Instagram. So I'm like, let me see what it would cost to get into the, the, the Knicks game, New York versus New York. Nah, <laughs> they had two seats at the all the way top back highest row section, like for two ninety five. You you pay your fees and all that. You're paying over three fifteen for two seats that are scary seats that I will never walk all the way up there in Barclays Center again to sit in. And I don't understand how people are doing it, but people want to tell me, oh, it's supply and demand, bro. They got. I'm like, oh, okay, they got to do that but that's whack. Like the optics look bad as you know, the, the, the fans are trying to get back in the stands, the real fans, New Yorkers coming out of a pandemic, trying to get back to some normalcy. You go click on those tickets and they want an arm in the leg. Nets fans are hitting me up like, Hey man, we're trying to get group packages. We're trying to get a group deal. I'm like, yo, I'm not beat for all this, but I will be reaching out to Riley, my ticket rep, maybe Sam and those guys and try and figure out some type of talking Nets ticket package. Uh, probably me, you twitchy, Dane, Mr. Burn Notice, I don't know, whoever else is down, hit us up, DM us. We will figure out how to get into these games. I think on the last episode I said we'll probably be back in the stadium in late March, early April. And I got that information from talking to my ticket rep. I knew these tickets were coming. But, like, I will pay, like, 150 bucks, 200 max, but I'm not paying that for seats that should never be over $100. Those seats are, like, they're, they're seats that should be damn near free. I don't care the circumstances either. All right, we should move on. Uh, we don't have all night for this, but I had to get that off my chest. And um, speaking of chests and speaking of money, Cam Soda. Cam Soda? Do you know what Cam Soda is? Not a can soda, but Cam Soda. I, honestly, I, I I hadn't heard of them before. I saw, I think <laughs> Scoop was the one that published it. He, he called them a, a virtual strip club and... As soon as I saw that headline, I was like, yeah, I know where this is going. I know what's coming next. <laughs> so speaking of chess and spending money, <laughs> Mr. Joe Sy received a letter from Darren Parker, vice president of Cam Soda, basically saying, hey, with the All-Star game coming up and All-Star weekend coming up, do we have a surprise for you and a special offer for your Brooklyn Nets? This guy sent a letter offering a virtual strip club to the Brooklyn Nets owner. Somehow this letter hit Twitter and I snagged and I'll read a little bit of it. My man says, I'll even double down and give the entire Nets team elite VIP membership status until the end of the season. If one of your players balls out and is named all-star game MVP. Who Harden? <laughs> Harden is our strip club guy. Look at all the energy we get when we get Harden and they know he's he's a strip club guy, right? These they're trying to sell virtual like I don't want to go to the strip club regularly. I actually used to DJ in a strip club. I started DJing in a strip club when I was Hudson's age. So another lifetime. But I'm like jaded by strip clubs. I've seen a ton of them. I've worked in them. Um a virtual strip club for why? For what? You would have to pay me to sit through a virtual strip club. Like you'd have to hit me with the money to sit down and watch that. Hudson's yeah, like, Hudson's know. like, I don't know what you're talking about, bro. I've never been in the strip club. <laughs> look, 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 my, my parents listen to this podcast. I can't, I can't be, I can't be going out saying too much, but <laughs> no, I, it just, it look, everyone's trying to capitalize on the nets. Everyone's trying to take advantage of the success in Brooklyn. 
So why not have a virtual strip club take advantage of that success and at least shoot their shot? I mean, we know getting guests on this podcast, that's all about shooting our shot, right? Hoping something lands, hoping something comes through. Facts. So listen, I respect the hustle. I, I respect the energy that they're bringing. Maybe just not, not, not the time for the Nets to uh, invest in a virtual strip club, though. Cam Soda, the leading adult webcam platform. Hi, Mr. Flynn. Hi, Mrs. Flynn, Hudson's parents. We're just joking around. All right, next subject. The Celtics, bro. We got to talk about this Celtics and Kyrie saga. I can't that believe. That continues. Why is it still I happening? Why is it still a thing? This is still coming up. Like, we're two seasons removed now? No, we're we're the 20, yeah, we're the 2019-2020 extended season removed. And we're two seasons removed now since Kyrie has been a Celtic. Why are y'all still talking about him? So on John Boy Media, we actually posted a video of Jason Tatum's press conference where you could hear them arguing in the background. I don't know if it was Danny Ainge. I don't know if it, like I don't know who it was, but the Celtics owner blame Kyrie's Ir Irving's departure for their struggles. Basically they're saying something like, we hope Kyrie would stay forever and lead us all the way. He's on maybe the best team in the league right now. So that's that. That change touched off a lot of stuff because he left. We weren't maybe able to recruit free agents. We weren't maybe. <laughs> we weren't maybe able to recruit free agents in the same way and a bit of a domino effect, but it is what it is. We went with it for Kyrie. We had a good year with him. He tried hard and then moved on. Bro, play better. And didn't you get hella picks from the Brooklyn Nets? Like, didn't we hook y'all up? Like, how come the team isn't better? Uh, stop making excuses and stop trying to blame Kyrie. I'm so tired of the treatment that he gets, yo. Before we go into the next treatment of Kyrie, Hudson, please tell me something about why the Celtics are so lame. Honestly, it's just, it's legitimately nonsense. Like, to go back, like, Kyrie ended up in Boston when the Cavs traded Isaiah Thomas. That was the centerpiece of the trade, if you want to think about how long ago that was. Like, we're talking about ancient history, and it's just the media narratives that continue about Kyrie. We've talked about it, you know, ad nauseum before. We're going to keep talking about it. It's going to continue to be nonsense. You know, all it took was the Nets getting their streak snapped, you know, when eight-game winning streak. Now we're eight and one in our last nine for Stephen A to come on first take this warning and say Ky Kyrie is the reason that the net the net sh it should be a nine game winning streak Kyrie didn't play shoulder maintenance what's that like I just it, it's always going to be Kyrie they they need to find a way to tear down the nets other teams need scapegoats and it's always going to be the person who's honestly the easiest scapegoat because he is so hated and so disliked around media circles for whatever reason that they're going to believe it and Celtics fans when they want someone to hate no matter what happens, it's always Kyrie. Celtics fans hated on Kyrie for burning sage in the TD Garden in preseason. Like it, it, it's just going he tried to, to continue help. this way. Listen, he tried. He tried, he tried to, to save the, the place. Didn't work. Celtics are garbage. Celtics have these two great players that can't seem to get them wins. They got the Bradley Beal effect going on. Sucks. Sucks. Celtics. Yeah, and uh, sucks to suck. So why don't y'all figure it out? I know you're, you're already like looking at the East and you're saying, oh, well, we're the sixth seed in the East. We can't compete. And you're looking for any other excuse besides the fact that you just don't have a good squad. You've made other moves. You've let some guys go and picked up some other guys and drafted some guys. Like it ain't all on Kyrie, but like, you know, like you said, bro, he's always the scapegoat. And that's because he's so good at basketball and he doesn't care what you think about him. Right. A guy that you can't control on the court. He goes off on the court and then he gets on the mic and goes off and then he goes on Instagram and goes off. And he's saying the type of stuff that y'all don't like to hear. I'm glad he got out of Boston. He didn't belong there. And he comes to Brooklyn and he's on one of the best teams we've ever seen. Offensively, they say this is one of the best teams ever. And he speaks on it right after we figure out how to win that game against the Magic, which we started off slow. Kyrie gets on the post-game press conference, and I actually happen to be watching this. And like I, I so the the thing about the Magic game Thursday, I also do a Yankees podcast called Pinstripe Strong, and we record every Thursday at seven thirty. And there was no way I could get out of that, and I didn't want to get out of it because that's part of my job and what I do. But I'm watching the game. Like even if you go listen to Pinstripe Strong in the beginning, I'm like ISO gang. Like I'm watching the game, and uh, we start off start off slow, but the Nets, like, 
come back and we'll talk about that game because we're not going to spend too much time talking about the Mavericks game, but I want to get this point across about Kyrie. I clipped up Kyrie talking and it was just one of those moments. Like I wasn't thinking like after the podcast was done, after the game was done, I was letting the post game play. And I tell you guys, you should always watch the yes network pregame and post game. I don't say that because the Yes Network has paid me and I'm a friend of the network. I say that because if you're a fan, that is how you get the most insight, right? People want to call you a bandwagoner or a casual fan. Well, watch the pregame and postgame and you'll learn something. Kyrie was kicking game and Malika Andrews, who's been crushing it since the bubble. Everybody knows her now, especially in the Nets world. She asked him a question about his comments on Kobe and the logo change. And we have to have this conversation on this pod. And I've been saying it since it happened because I'm like, I can't wait to get on Talking Nets to have this conversation. And I'll lead it off as a black person, as a black king, as a black man who can relate to Kyrie and someone who has also gone through grief, losing someone very close to them. When I watched that video and I clipped it, I was going to clip it and post it from Talking Nets, but I just couldn't think about the words, the right words to put around it. But I had the right words for myself. I didn't have the right words for our brand. And what I wanted to get across was the point that Kyrie was was saying, well, everything that Kyrie was saying was correct, right? Jerry West doesn't represent this league. Black Kings made this league. Like we need to have a logo refresh, a brand refresh that better, you know, just, I don't know, better shows what this league is about and who this league is about. Now, I don't know if Kobe will ever be the guy because of the controversy surrounding, uh, I don't know, Colorado back in 2003, which people can say whatever they want about that, but we don't really have the hard facts on that. And like that type of thing, like I don't even want to get into, but what I will say is that Kyrie wasn't off base with his comments about changing the logo. And I'm glad that the conversation got started. Because then they can say, oh, maybe it should be MJ. Sure. Maybe it should be LeBron. Sure. Sure thing. Like those two guys sound like guys that should be it. But I put this clip out and Bleacher Report DM me, asked me if they could share it. They shared it. House of Highlights shared it. Radio.com shared it. And someone else shared it. And I mean, it got it got a lot of views. Um, but really what I was proud of was the fact that it got the conversation started. Like, look at this league, man. The logo is Jerry West. Jerry West said change the logo. It should be more reflective of who's in the league and the kids in the league right now of the men in the league right now, when they were kids, they looked up to Kobe. Kobe was the golden standard. Kobe was the guy that got drafted out of high school that everybody wanted to be went on and won five championships and that Mamba mentality. That's what everyone should strive to be. And Kyrie said what he said. And he got off the mic and I stand by what he said. I don't think it'll ever be Kobe on the logo, but I'm glad the conversation started that maybe one day it will be changed to a black man. And we're watching the league. It's, it just is what it is, fellas. Like this black guys in the league. Like, I don't know. I wouldn't care if, if this was the NBA and it was, you know, all white guys I'd watch. I watch baseball. Hudson, what you got? Yeah, no, it, you pretty much said it all, but every conversation has to start somewhere. And I'm proud as a Nets fan, as an NBA fan, that Kyrie Irving was the one to start it. And like, if the guy that's on the logo is like, yeah, maybe it's time for a new era of people on the logo to, to be representative of the sport. I, I support that fully. And if, in, you know, going hand in hand with that, it comes with being, you know, Kobe, MJ, LeBron, whoever it ends up being. And that's representative of the, the people that, you know, players grew up watching, the, the right vibes that the NBA is trying to promote. Like, it, what's the loss, right? I, I, don't, I don't understand what the counter argument would be other than, like, maybe not Kobe in particular. Okay, MJ. Okay, LeBron. Okay, whoever, you know, insert name here that is representative of the culture of the league. And I, I, I don't see any counter argument to that, especially considering – that the person on the logo is, is like, listen, it's time, it's time for a brand refresh and every league needs it more often. And NBA is they're the Kings of updating themselves and their brand to what is the right vibes at the right time. Yep. And as both of us MLB fans, spring training just started yesterday, watching the Yankees play like that. We're fans of a league that doesn't ever do that. That embraces you know, old timey guys, you know, and like, you know, Cy Young pitching in the 1800s for the Cleveland Spiders. Like 
that's that's not the vibe anymore. And the vibe in the NBA is not that era of basketball anymore. It's the Kobe era of basketball that he instituted as a cultural icon. So there's just no reason not to and every reason to. And that's really the extent of it. You see how my youngin comes through and talks? He's a young white kid, but he's not racist. He's got good parents. They brought him up the right way. If you get offended by someone like Kyrie suggesting that we change the logo to a black man, you just got some racism in you and you need to work those issues out. I thought after 2020, we got somewhere further, but from all of the comments that came through that thread, like I literally had to mute Bleacher Report tagging me because I'm like, oh my God, the ignorance, like the level of ignorance that's coming out of people's tweets. But you know what it is on Twitter, man. It's mostly people with a, an emoji or a gray silhouette or a cartoon or, you know, their favorite player. And they're, they're throwing stones and hiding their hands. They don't have to put their name next to the, their account, but they can get their opinion across. I'm glad we were able to get our opinion across. Let's talk about this magic game, right? Magic game. We hate the magic. Game 34 out of 72, that was Thursday night in Brooklyn. The Nets win 129-92, and the Nets are currently 22-13, and 13, second place in the East, a half game back. And that game started off slow. Hudson, you were on that game. Like I said, I was recording the pod. I was watching it, but you were clipping it up, and I saw some of your stuff. We started off slow, and you were definitely questioning what was going on. So I'll let you run with the coverage of the Magic game. Yeah, there was there was a lot of questionable stuff going on. I have never seen so many air balls, like mostly in the first quarter, but just throughout the game, people were just not hitting anything. They were <laughs> taking shots that were going into the bleachers. It was ridiculous. But on both sides, good shooters were taking shots and missing shots. But obviously, the Nets were able to put it together. They put on a good defensive performance that was expected of them against a team that's dealing with a lot of injuries and that already isn't very good. We had to deal with Vucevic, who is a certified Nets killer through and through. I hate the Magic. I hate everything that is involved with the Magic. But Vucevic has never played a bad game against the Nets. He just continuous, continually lights them up. But we saw some good things. We saw Clax play some good defense, move his feet. And that was huge, seeing the resurgence of Clax putting together some good performances, a career high in steals. Like, the man was just going off and playing well coming off of this major injury. So that was exciting to see. It was exciting to see the Nets be able to run out some of their depth late in the game and see how that looked. And it was just a good all-around win against a bad team, obviously excluding the struggle, the trouble, troubles we had at first. And we did what we, was expected of us. And we continued the winning streak to eight games at that time. And it was just, it was good to see that the Nets can go up against a bad team and beat them through and through, essentially wire to wire, and just let the league know, like, listen, like, this, we're not a fluke, right? We're not like, you know, crazy scoring nights, but we get 130 put up on us every night. This isn't the team that lost to the Wizards in the last seconds, letting up 140 plus points. This is a clinical lethal team that can go out and just light up the league. And that's what, despite this loss against the Mavericks, we have done and we are going to continue to do as we get healthy, as we improve, as we add pieces into the future. Yeah, so quickly, I didn't have too much from the uh, Magic game besides the fact that we scored 41 points in the second quarter. I was trying to get off the podcast. I'm like, yo, something is happening. Like, It was 28-24 uh, after the fourth, and then we score 41 in the second quarter. They score 19, and then it was pretty much over. And go back to our episodes this summer in the bubble and we talk about how much we hate the magic. Go back to our episodes in the bubble in the summer. And we talk about what goes on in this country. Black Lives Matter being on the court. And uh, the magic and the Bucks about to play. And the game stops. And we recorded right when they paused the NBA. We thought the NBA was going to get shut down. Like us having these conversations on Talking Nets is nothing new. But what else from that game? Oh, this is uh, the last game of the win streak eight games officially the only other team that had a longer streak I think was the Jazz and this is when there was just a lot of talk about the scoring and the offensive output you know we scored five points in the first six minutes and then we come out in the second quarter and put up 41 it's, it's miraculous actually it's like ridiculous to see happen and uh that's our longest streak since 05 06 for your Nets I'm wearing the throwback jersey with Vince Carter from those days, um, talking about Katie and him not playing, 
I put out a video two Saturdays ago, basically saying, yo, shut KD down for the all-star break. And they did. So I wasn't surprised not to see him in these games. Kyrie and Harden are seven and two together without Kyrie. That's not pretty bad. Have to send a sham, uh, a, a shout out, have to send a Shamit shout out. Um, Landry Shamit has come along and we were rough on him. We were tough on him. We cyber bullied him. And I, I realized this guy's 23 years old. He's a young man adjusting to New York City, the bright lights, and being on the number one team in the NBA. And a lot was expected uh, of him. And he's starting to actually, like, give us what we thought we were trading for. 19 points, nine rebounds. I think we had a total of 36 points off the bench. Nick Claxton, second game back. Gotta love it. I like it. Um, but TLC, bro, you're on notice. 25 minutes five points like TLC after that Mavs game I was looking at TLC like you about to lose your job you about TLC. to lose your job <laughs> he's, he's he's more than on he's on burn notice he is on he is on the thinnest ice that ice can be especially <laughs> after the Nets you know gave him that guaranteed money that 1.7 million dollars passing the guarantee deadline and he's going out putting up you know big minus numbers in that last game against the Mavericks and boy we're not really seeing that bubble TLC, that TLC who was able to kind of expand his role. And it's unfortunate because he's obviously, like we said, a young guy with a lot of potential, but we're no longer seeing that come through anymore. He's got what is fair to say a ridiculously low basketball IQ. And I don't want to get too much into that Mavericks game right now, but we saw him make one good play. He got a steal and he's on the break. And then what does he do? He throws it out of bounds. Yeah. It's tripped. It's just the, the TLC experiment is starting to look like it's over. He's starting to look more and more expendable for the good of this team. And it's just, it's unfortunate, but we got Shemet stepping up into his new role. Obviously we have uncle Jeff who came back in that Mavericks game, but is actually out for the Spurs game. But yeah, no, it, it, it's, it, it's tough. It's not good, but the nets have those role players that have been able to expand their roles. And it's exciting to see that despite this bad performance we are not reliant on this player that is very inconsistent and when he is consistent is honestly consistently not very good yeah let's play these voicemails and then talk about the Mavericks game okay so obviously I don't really care about this game no KD no Kyrie it's whatever Mavs were healthy Porzingis came back number one TLC I don't know what they're saying he can't dribble he can't pass he can't play defense and the one thing he's good at is, I don't, want, I don't even want to say good at, he's average shooter. And uh, when he's not doing that, uh, he's useless, basically. Uh, it took the second most shots on the team tonight. But, you know, this is not about TLC. I was wondering what you guys think, because tonight Porzingis was kind of terrorizing us with the uh, switch everything defense that Nash runs. Uh, he's 7-3, and, I mean, in the playoff series against uh, – and bead. I'm hoping we would make some adjustments to that type of defense, but I mean, if Nash is going to run that out there, I feel like we kind of stand no chance, and we're not playing any other defense, so if he wants to make a switch on the fly, the guys might not be able to uh, adjust that quickly. I hope they will, but they might not, so I was just wondering what your thoughts were on the uh, switch everything defense against Joel and Bede, possibly, in a seven-game series. Nets World, let's go. Nets World. Hudson, tell us what you're thinking about Joel Embiid down the line after we just faced Chris Stapp's Porzingis. I wouldn't necessarily compare the two, but I understand like exactly where this voicemail is coming from with the switch everything defense. So go ahead, Hudson. Well, that's my first major complaint I've had with Nash in what feels like about a month since that little losing streak we had capped off with the, uh, the Pistons loss. He ran out a very, very small lineup, like in a, like smaller than our normal small lineup against a team with a seven, three player who can score inside and hit threes. And that is not the way to, to, to win games. And I understand the switch, everything defense. I think we have some of the pieces that are able to do it. Obviously with Clax coming back, you're very excited to see the way that the nets are switching. Cause he has the ability to move his feet, frankly, but we're going to need to set up, you know, defenses that are made for certain players. And, in a regular game during the regular season, we can't necessarily do that. We couldn't sit down just with the way that this net season is so hectic and so crazy and really create a, a specialized defense to stop Chris Stapps who hasn't been that impressive this season. But 
going into the future, looking at a seven game series against a team like Philly, against a player like Joel Embiid, obviously leading MVP candidate can hit from, you know, every spot in the court, someone that you have to create a personalized defensive scheme for. We're going to have the time to do that. We're going to have the ability to do that. And if you remember, we don't actually have, we haven't had a win against the 76ers with this new team. The last time we beat them was this season with Jared Allen shutting him down. We don't have that option anymore. So we're going to have to sit down and really spend some time thinking about what we're going to do to be able to beat him because that's probably going to be the first hurdle of the playoffs for us. Because once we get there and once we get against that, you know, two seed, one seed, whatever it ends up being in the 76ers, we are going to have to spend some time devoted to focusing on how to stop him. And I think the Nets are able to do it. I think they're capable of doing it, but we are going to have to put some time, some effort into that. But at the same time, it's going to be a very different team. We will have hit the buyout market. We will have made changes. And I expect those changes are going to be with the thought in mind that we are going to be playing in Eastern Conference Finals against the 76ers and Joel Embiid. Hudson said that'll be the first hurdle. He said the first couple of series will be a breeze. We ain't worried about those until we get to the Sixers, one versus two. Hopefully we're one and they're two. But I'm not worried about that right now. I'm not worried about that right now. I can't be worried about Joel Embiid. Actually, that night, the way the universe works, our guy, our former guy, our old guy, uh, it's so hard to say goodbye. Jared Allen was playing against Joel Embiid that night. And from what I saw, was giving him some work. And I'm pretty sure the Cavs won. Didn't the Cavs beat the... The Sixers? Cavs won in OT. And we're like, yo, somebody tell the Nets that the Sixers lost so that we can come back and win and take first place. But I can't be too worried about that, bro. Kyrie wasn't on the court. KD has not been on the court. This is not the team. I think I said in the post game, like, I don't care about this game. I don't care about this game. When I'm looking at this game, and, and I'll play the next voicemail before I get too deep into it. I'm looking at guys on the court like Shumpert, Robertson. Robertson played 20 minutes, bro. Uh, Chioza played 15 minutes, bro. Like, that's not going to happen. Uh, our, our new guy, um, Tim, Tim Cook from Apple, uh, Tyler Cook, our new guy, Tyler Cook, played minutes that game. And he hasn't been on the team for a week. So it's like, I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't read into that too much and be worried about Joel Embiid. Let's play the next voicemail talking about this Mavericks game. Yo, what's up, Nets fam? This is Joel, a.k.a. Bird's Eye View on Twitter. Um, I see a lot of Nets fans out there feeling discouraged, feeling like that loss meant something last night. Guys, we just need to relax. The Nets are going to be fine. Eight-game win streak over. That's fine. We'll start a new one. Let's go, Nets. Brooklyn. Hard Brooklyn. Emphatic Brooklyn correct Brooklyn because the Nets do not have anything to worry about we go hard we're good we go I'll, hard we're going I'll to continue to go work. hard something like that scary hours something like that yeah, I no. don't know no worries <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't watched scary hours in how long man <laughs> I was that, just that, like that, that game is not a concern in both of our post-game recaps we we're like okay yeah we lost but like how much can you read into that they decided to rest Kyrie like three hours before the game you know, uh, they were shooting threes and hitting them. There was a point in that Mavericks game where I'm like, they're hitting everything from that spot on like the left wing, like Luca Hardaway. It does not matter. That was a nationally televised game on ESPN, which like I prefer the Yes Network call. So whenever these games are on national t television, I'm already just like a little bit like, well, whatever. That was a game for the haters. That was a game for, I don't know, the haters in Houston to tune in and watch Harden and be like, see, See, he lost. He couldn't beat Luca, And it's like, oh, like they didn't even kill us. Uh, Porzingis had 18. Luca had 27. And I think Hardaway had a, a, another 13. And who else? That, that was their top three scores. It wasn't like they killed us. And we didn't have our two best players. And we literally had a tryout. Like, we literally had guys out there on the floor trying out. Let's play this, uh, this last voicemail. What's up? This Katie checking in. I just finished watching the Mavs game. My thoughts basically were, um, like, our defense and turnovers. I feel like the, the reason why our defense was so poor because, like, it started with the, turn, the, the, like, the mental mistakes on offense. And, like, yeah, it was good. Uh, what's up, everyone? How y'all doing? It's KD. All right, later.
Oh yeah, I like I like what y'all doing on Talk and that's keep it up. I'm gonna tune in to every vid. Thanks, King. I like I think he said so the transcript says Katie, K-A-T-I-E. I don't think that's Katie. But then I thought KD, like Kevin Durant or Cash Doll. I don't know if you guys saw Cash no, Doll it, on it, Twitter. It's Cash. You mean the, you mean the real KD, Cash Doll? <laughs> Yo, shout out to him though. So I mean, he's talking about defense and all this stuff. Like, I can't judge the team. That is not the team. What what like what you saw on Saturday night is not the Nets that is going to be uh, running through the playoffs. So why would I even be too critical of that team? Yeah, they were running the NBA equivalent of like an open gym, like. <laughs> This is it, literally it's, it's not the team. It was just a, it was just a bunch of dudes lining up next to Kevin Durant. Like some things you want to look at from that game. Don't like what Nash did with the, the lineups, I guess. You know, some struggles on defense. Maybe Joe Harris didn't get enough shots. TLC shouldn't be taking 12 shots. But at the end of the day, it's not a game to overreact to. It's not a game to read into. The Nets do have two big games, one that we're going to talk about on the podcast, this Spurs game. And then we have the reunion, the return. James Harden versus Houston to talk about on Thursday. And those games, if we have a healthy team, obviously without KD, those are games we can talk about. Yeah, and like I said, I think that was a punt game. Uh, the, the Nets didn't care about that game. Kyrie rested, and we lost that game, and it ended the streak. And it's like, okay, we didn't get to nine games. But, uh, you know, I remember us losing eight games in a row not too long ago. So I'm, I'm happy with the win streak. I'm happy with the Nets. And uh, like I said, that game, they, they had guys on the court that are not going to get that many minutes. TLC minus 32. I saw you tweet out his minus 32. And you're like, do what you want with that information. <laughs> he had six yeah, points. I'm not going di- to directly 12. hate on our guy, but two for 12 minus Ooh. 32. Oh, Yikes. man, Rugs, TLC. you about to lose your job. Like, he's starting, and he's supposed to be that guy coming off the bench to hit corner threes and open looks. But there's other guys that are showing us that they can do that. I don't know. We'll see. What else from that game? Off game for Joe Harris, but not that off. He, he didn't take that many shots. It was TLC, two for 12. That hurts. All right, that's all we got from the Mavericks game, and we already talked about the Magic game. What we're going to do is take a break. And then we're going to watch the Spurs game and then come back after the Spurs game, record the rest of the podcast, and we'll read your reviews and close this thing out. Talking Nets. Okay, and we're back. And let's lead off with another voicemail. This guy's got two voicemails, but that's okay because he's part of the TN fam. Our guy, Bird's Eye View, just got his fresh Harden uh, beard silhouette tea in the mail. And I haven't listened to this voicemail yet. But he was on one of the other voicemails we played and this one that I'm about to play right now. Yo, what's up? This is Joel, Bird's Eye View. Looking at this game, all I can say is clacks, 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 my man. Claxton putting up big numbers tonight for us, putting up big minutes for us tonight. I know he looked winded. He'll get his legs under him. He's just killing it for us. I knew he was going to be important for us. Let's keep it going, boys. Brooklyn. Yeah, I like how my man ends it with just, let's go Nets. Brooklyn. The firm Brooklyn. <laughs> Brooklyn, we outside. All right, so let's talk about this game. Let's talk about Nick Claxton. Nick Claxton comes in. I said in my post game, career high, filling up the stat sheet, had some blocks, had some rebounds, had a steal, pick Patty Mills pocket. I enjoyed that, but I was frightened. I was scared. I should probably turn the TV off. That's going to be in the podcast. Um, Hudson, say some stuff. Yeah, no, Clax is uh, <laughs> Clax is Clax, and this is only his 18th career game, and he was able to put up these numbers like like we all expected, but we haven't seen him do before. He put this up 17 and 17 minutes, and, but yeah, it was the injury that kind of left you with a uh, with a bad feeling in your chest. You saw that first one where he got rolled up on; that was the scariest one for me. And then he comes back, stays strong, stays in the game, gets a steal, is going coast to coast trying to finish it, gets fouled, gets hit right in the face by DeMar DeRozan, and then he goes down hard, able to hit his free throws, and then stay in for a little while longer, and then he subbed out. He, he really showed that toughness, that grit that you you expect, obviously, from, from an NBA player, but he's, you know, he's a rookie, and he's a he's a, a smaller guy. Like, he's tall, but he's, he's slight. He's not, he doesn't have, like, the build of a DeAndre Jordan, and he's taking these, these, these bumps, these bruises in stride, staying in the game, doing what he can to contribute to this Nets team. And it's just really awesome to see because it's that 
it's that the potential that we all knew he had that we know that he had going into this season that we didn't get to see quite yet finally materializing and man he's not even close to 100 percent. so when he gets to be 100 percent, the league better be scared because right now he's looking like he should be our starting center man i love it and and you said he's a rookie and i know there's new fans and new people listening he's a rookie uh, it's his second year on the team but this guy played i don't know how many games last year it was like a handful of games and he was he played done. 15 games last year he played 15 games so he's still in his rookie season um, he's, he's learning, he's figuring things out, but he's a beast. We told you that from the jump, we're like, this guy's got the right energy and he's obviously got the build and it's good to see him. Yeah. I think this is his fourth game since he's been back. It's good to see him like getting his legs under him and getting loose out there. It sucks to see him get hurt. Like I was scared. I was like, no, Claxton, bro, get up. Um, but yeah, other than Claxton, Bruce Brown, I said in the post game, I said, Bruce Brown is in his big brown bag. I said little brown bag because he's small. He's not a big, like, you know, he's biggie smalls to us, you know, playing the five, playing bigger than he is. But I love to see Bruce Brown just keeping it up now, right? Now that you've shown the world who you are, deliver. So he had a season high 29 points. He comes out tonight with 23 are you kidding me? Oh, can we expect a consistent 20 points out of Bruce Brown? <laughs> it's crazy. Like, like at a certain point, like when KD comes back, we don't want to like take him out of this main rotation. It's Bro. Bruce Brown. It's the Bruce Brown show. And it's more than just like it, the scoring is coming as a secondary, right? And uh, as Coach Nash just talked about it in the press conference. We clipped it up. That's a secondary part of his game, his defense, his energy, his pace. That's you know, what, what really, you know, he brings to the table, but now he's scoring and now that's coming. And like you talked about, now he's making use of that push shot that he wasn't allowed to shoot in Detroit. And it's just crazy. And really what it is, is his ability to play off of Harden. Right. And that's how we saw Harden put up, honestly, a performance that I don't think either of us talked about as much as we should have in our post game, 30 points, 15 assists and 14 rebounds with no turnovers. Yeah, I saw someone this like, is, what about Harden's stat line? It's like, bro, we're just reacting without looking at the box score right after the game. But now that I'm looking at the box score, I'm like, Harden is Harden is an MVP. Um, we can get out in front of this. Harden will be the MVP if things keep going the way they're going. If he is captain of this ship, I'm the captain now. I told you guys weeks ago, the way that this is going, this is Harden's team. Not to start any type of division. When I say this is Harden's team, it's not taken away from Kyrie or KD, but he is the one stirring the drink. Do you all not see what's happening? This is a ridiculous stat line. And he is the one that will lead us to where we got to go. And that has an MVP tag coming with it. Like that's got an MVP. I know they want to give it to Braun this year. I get all that. But if we go where we're supposed to go and James Harden is doing this on a nightly basis, bro, that's the MVP. Absolutely. And without a doubt, like it's really just absurd what he's been doing as like as a Brooklyn net. And people are kind of ignoring it because of what happened at the beginning of the season. You look at his numbers, they're a little skewed because of those early games. With Since coming to the Nets, since playing in the team that he will play for for the rest of the season, he has been the best player in the NBA. And, it, you know, it's contentious. There's argument there. But, like, when you're seeing him put up numbers like a 3-point, 15-assist, 14-rebound, triple-double with no turnovers, crazy. there's no other way to describe it other than MVP. Bro, talking about being in your bag and being in full control, doing what he does with no turnovers, and all we see is, Mm, no look pass mm, grab the ball dish it mm, now i'm gonna shoot i had no doubts if you go and look at our instagram i posted the starting five graphic i said this will be the starting five that will beat san antonio even during the game i said i, I wasn't even worried about the game it did go to ot and i was a little worried because Kyrie missed a layup and i'm like Kyrie don't miss layups like that with the game on the line but i wasn't worried because i said Kyrie and Harden will close this out, and they did. Kyrie hit a big three. Boom. Harden came back, matched one. Bruce Brown found Kyrie in the corner waiting for the three. You got to love it. You got to love it, Nets fans. I love it. I'm watching the post game now. I low-key want to get off the pod because Kyrie comes in with the walking stick and the uh, National Congress of American Indians hat, so I know he's on his, you know, he's about to talk, and if you've been following his Twitter, he's getting his Twitter active. I don't know if y'all follow Kyrie. Like Kyrie does his Instagram story stuff, his tweets. He doesn't tweet that much, but lately he's been on 
some real shit on Twitter and you should check that out. I'm not going to read it for you. I'm just going to tell you to check it out. Um, what else we got from this game, bro? Uh, individual people that, oh, you know what? The first thing I thought, what did I say before the game? I said, TLC, you about to lose your job. Now, I know TLC is questionable with right knee soreness, but he didn't play. And I think that's like, take the night off, buddy. That's uh, a DNP. That's a DNP. <laughs> I hate to say it because we both kind of stand TLC over the over the year. The last year, obviously Hudson with the French ties. And we saw him at the Nets ticket holder event and that like made us fans of him. And we were on his bandwagon early because when we came in, we we're like, this guy was a first round pick. He's got potential, blah, 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 blah. And then when he showed that, we were like, yeah, we called that. But now... He's kind of taking a step back. And I literally said before this game, you're about to lose your job. Then we go on this game. He's questionable with right knee sor uh, soreness, and then he doesn't even play. So that's a DMP. I don't know. That's all I got. Not a good this, look. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to end it on that negative type note. So what I'll say is uh, Steve Nash came to coach tonight against, you know, arguably the greatest coach in NBA history. And we yeah. got to, we got to give him some respect after what was, not an especially impressive coaching performance against the Mavs. So you got to give him his respect. And we saw what happens when you go up against a, a, a Greg Popovich coach team with Pecky Hammond on the staff. That is coaching royalty. And they showed it that we couldn't pull away from them for the majority of the game, really, until overtime. Yeah, but man. Coach Nash was able to coach a good enough game to get the Nets that win. And that's huge. That's huge for his confidence. That's huge for this team. And that's huge just going forward and looking out what we need to do to win playoff games yeah matt brooks had a tweet about like has anyone given steve nash the credit he deserved and i replied i'm like yeah a couple episodes ago i said steve nash is turning into a hell of a coach and i said that because on the west coast trip i think it was after the suns game the way we finished that game i'm like it's just a complete turnaround from the collapse that we saw you know a couple weeks ago with the wizards and um you know he's got these guys really coming together and communicating and working better on defense. And like I said, I think on one of these episodes, I said, you don't even hear him talk about offense. Whenever he's mic'd up or inside, inside tracks, he's coaching defense and these guys have responded and it's just been a good time. It's been a great run and it's continuing. We're back to our winning ways. And last thing from this game in the fourth quarter, the Spurs scored 27, we scored 27, but in overtime, right? We closed them out early. We scored 16. They scored five in overtime. Done. Defense. Defense. Talk about defense. Okay, last thing I'm going to touch on here um, with the Nets is these tickets, right? I see a lot of people, and I know we already talked about the tickets. I see a lot of people trying to put together groups and stuff and ticket plans and stuff like that. I will get back to you guys on that because, like, I do want to go to the game. I just think it's ridiculous, like, how they, they set it up. It's not supply and demand. I saw a lot of people like supply and demand, supply and demand, like go look up supply and demand and then go look at how the Nets decided to change up their supply because of the demand. Um, I don't know. That's it. What, do, what else do you got? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can give a, yeah, no, I, it, that's, that's, yeah, it's just not a, not, not the correct argument. If you want me to give a quick economics lesson, like so pure supply and demand does not apply uh, in, in in the in the current American economic model, if if the Nets want first off, if the Nets wanted to take a loss on that just to generate more hype around the team, they could have. If the Nets wanted to open up more seats so they make you know the certain amount of seats you know cheaper, they could have also done that. The Knicks have more seats open. I don't want to get too much into it, but there's ways for it to happen. There's ways for it to be cheaper, and I hope that the Nets recognize that and you know put something out there for for the regular fans so that they can go and, and bring some of the energy in the stadium. All right, that's all we got. The Nets. Go to San Antonio, and they win for the first time since we, I think we won there during the NBA Finals in 2003, but the last regular season game we won was 2002. Um, just hoping I didn't miss anything. Hoping I didn't forget anything here. Jeff Green was out today. That's fine. We have one more Nick game. Nick Claxton is trending. Yeah, Nick Claxton is trending because people are starting to learn. And I see a lot of uh, people like my guy, uh, Chris McFly from Pinstripe Strong. He's like, yo, I picked Claxton up and started him in fantasy. Like people are looking at the Nets role players and bench players and trying to find the next guy. So, man, it's great. Our world, Nets world. We will be back with another episode after the James Harden revenge game, the Rockets 
And I think that's the last game before the all-star break. And we have a special guest potentially, but I like, I said to Hudson, like, I hate like even hinting at a special guest just in case something falls through. But even if this guest falls through, we got some plans for some other guests and a lot more coming on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, everything, Facebook, shout out to the Facebook groups, shout out to all the Nets group chats on Twitter and Instagram. Make sure you follow us. Oh, how am I forgetting? I know how I'm forgetting because it's past my bedtime. It's 1133 at night. We cannot close this episode without reading these we got reviews. Nice reviews. We got reviews. These people are so nice. I don't know what we did to deserve this many nice people writing reviews about us. So this is a review that just was a comment on YouTube that it touched me. I I was thinking about mums and and biscuits and tea and crumpets. So Evelar writes, I love the podcast. Thanks for being so welcoming to new fans. I'm in the UK, and when the football finished last year due to COVID, my son said, try basketball, and I'm hooked. I only knew three players. Playing now, KD, LeBron, and Steph Curry. And so I went with KD in Brooklyn. My son has the NBA League Pass, and I haven't missed a Nets game since. Can I thank Hudson for his Twitter feed during games as well? It's great when I'm watching the game at 4.30 a.m. and hiding behind my sofa. I don't think my son expected to end up with a mom obsessed with the Nets. Keep up the great work. I'm touched. Making I'm, me smile, make me blush. I'm touched. But, yo, that's not Hudson's Twitter feed. Like, I started the feed. He learned how to do his thing, and I let him do it because I can't started be doing all this time. Started the feed. I was at Talking Nets before you. Oh, listen, listen, we can get semantic <laughs> cement. I, I appreciate it. I made it. the Talking Nets logo it. before you were even on the team. All right, here's the next review. And this is an Apple review from our guy, JJ, who is a Nets fan and a Yankees fan. And I've talked to JJ a bunch on Twitter. He says, you guys are awesome. Nice vibes. Great hosts. Best podcast to walk to work to. Seriously, though, Hudson and Keith, you both make my walk really enjoyable. Please keep up the roast in the future pods. It brought a huge smile to my face. Yeah, I mean. I, I try not to roast Hudson because especially I learned that his parents listen to the pod. I don't want to really roast him, but I could cook him. If like, if I really wanted to, I could lean into so many things. Look, one of these days, one of these days, it's going to come to that. And we still have a, a pending one-on-one -on -one game. So bro, we, and we, like, we can find some things out. Maybe, maybe you're going to be left with just <laughs> words. That's all I'm going to say. Yo, I would, I would love to play Hudson one-on-one. -on -one. We could play to five. We could play to 10. We could play to 21. Film it, live stream it. Like I'm, I'm so with that. All right, here's the last one. Amazing pod. And this is from DNR Jenny, uh, D -N -R -J -E -N -E -F -M -S -N. I, I have no idea. Love it. As of right now, this pod is in my top two favorite podcasts to listen to. It's you guys and R2C2. Love what you guys have been doing and keep up the amazing work. Yo, we're we in the company of famous people. We, we're talking Hall of Fame pitchers and national broadcasters. What are we doing, Hudson? We should probably quit now. We should probably just stop the pod at episode 84. That's it. Hang us up in the rafters at Barclays Center. Honestly, I mean, look, look, look. Ruko was in our presence. He came on our podcast. Facts, more facts. I will say that. That's a good way to close. We had Ruko on this pod, and CC's been showing hella love to Talking Yanks, John Boy Media on Instagram. There should be some type of synergy crossover. I don't know. They, they were supposed to do a R2C2 Talking Yanks, but if y'all want to do a R2C2 Talking Nets and talk some NBA and talk some baseball, talk some MLB, Yankees, Nets, whatever, Hudson and I are here, and we're going to keep working. We're very early in this. Talking Yanks has been around for four years. We've been around for one year. Talking Yanks is approaching like 600 episodes. We're approaching 85. So that just gives you a, a thought about where we are in our road to um, just being legit. So as we're trying to be legit, we got to wrap up this pod. It's getting late, and I have to edit this thing. 
Make sure you leave a voicemail. You heard other people on the pod. You heard other voices on the pod. That's because they called the voicemail. I literally screen these and play probably 90% of them. So the number is 201-870-0461. Make sure you follow us at Talking Nets. Follow John Boy Media. And like that's across platforms. We're going into baseball. There's a lot of cool stuff coming, but we're going into the second half of the NBA season and we're going to maximize this brand and this account too. So follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. I think we even have a TikTok. I just don't, I don't be doing the talks too old for that. Uh, Hudson, where can they follow you? They can follow me at Hudson Flynn underscore to see exclusive content of me getting roasted by Keith about my age about once a week. Yeah, I definitely like, I mean, that's easy. I could roast you about like how young you are, but I could also roast you about like having to go to class, uh, not having a vehicle, not having any money, um, being stuck on campus in Fordham gated. <laughs> All right. What else we got? You can follow me at Keith McPherson, but I really don't care about that. Follow Talking Nets. We're about to break 6,000 followers on Twitter. And like, I don't, I did not expect that to happen so quickly, but now I want to get like 10,000 by the end of the season. Make sure you subscribe to the pod. Seriously, rate the pod, leave five stars and write a review. These reviews help. It just makes us look good when we're talking to other brands, other guests, podcasts, whatever, you know, we're a new podcast. So if you, if you see us, I think we have 60 reviews. I think we have a 4.5 rating. I'm sorry. There were some haters in the beginning, but you know, hate is like the same as love. It's, it's just the other side of the coin. If somebody's hating on you and listening to you, that means they probably love you and they just hate that they can't do what you're doing. So subscribe, rate, and review the pod. We appreciate all y'all, all y'all Nets fans. I hope y'all get tickets and get into one of these games, not for three hundo, not for one, not for one something. Like if you're going to sit all the way up there, man, it should not be more than $100. I got to talk to somebody about that. They got to change that. But yeah, that's all I got, man. And hopefully I can get Hudson and I into the Barclays Center. But if we can't get in, maybe we'll do some live streams so you can see us during the games chanting, let's go Nets, Brooklyn. We go hard, go hard.